in only two years from the outbreak of the corona crisis, the whole world managed to mobilize a coordinated and robust response to de develop a COVID-19 vaccine and treatment. For more than six years, scientists have raised concerns about the impact human-related emissions could have on the world. For more than 30 years, we have known about the climate change, and that could be a potential threat to the species and ecosystems around the world. The corona crisis has shown us how rapidly we can change if you recognize clearly the need to do so. And the incentives of key actors in policy, in industry and the society are aligned. The potential global impacts of the climate crisis are slower to materialize and much graver than those of the corona crisis. And those actions to be taken are not less urgent. So why haven't they managed in all these years we are known by, about the climate changes to mobilize a bold collective action to combat the climate crisis? One reason could be that many people, especially here in Norway, don't recognize there is a climate crisis just yet. Norwegians might feel less threatened about the climate crisis than many other countries, and therefore might not feel the urgency to mobilize. Or, reluctance to change could be related to our standard of living and our dependence on oil. The Norwegian economy, the labor force, and financing of the welfare state could be at risk. Therefore, we are not that in a hurry to change. Or, even if we wanted to mobilize for a green transition, there might be obstacles to do so. It could be jobs, it could be the infrastructure, or there could be established networks that are difficult to break through. I have made a personal green shift in my life. I worked more than 20 years within the financial sector. For more than a decade, I worked as an oil analyst. And then I changed job to sustainable finance. And the change did not happen overnight. It was rather a process that took place over several years. I first became aware of the devastating effect of the climate changes from my passion for Sir David Attenborough's documentaries about the nature. And then I read the famous book by Al Gore called The An Inconvenient Truth. Several years later, working as an oil analyst, I started to get questions. Questions from environmentalists, questions from journalists. What do you think about the renewable sector going forward? What do you think about stranded assets? Moving through the different phases of awareness, acknowledgement, uncertainty, and then threat. Threat to the society threat to nature, threat to my family, threat to my job. I reached a tipping point where it was time to take action. I could not justify any longer working as an oil analyst, so I changed my job to sustainable finance. I had created my own green new path. Following the progress of the green transmission closely for all these years, I'm still puzzled why this large sums of capital still goes into industry projects with high emissions. In my work lately, I paid special interest 
to two potential explanations that can slow the green transition. These are market fa failure, which is basically the failure of a market to deliver an optimal result. And then is path dependency. The most commonly recognized market failure associated to climate risk is the negative externalities of emission. Basically, the price we're paying today does not take into account the negative effect of our consumption to the society and to nature. In this talk, I will focus on path dependency. Path dependency arises when the initial conditions and history have an impact on the eventual outcomes. Path dependency does not necessarily have to be negative. It can strengthen a particular direction of economic development, among other things such as learning and network effects. The problem arises when path dependency leads to economies being locked into an unfavorable development. For example, Norway, an oil and gas producing country, we have new projects of oil and gas coming up in production. And that means that capital, human capital and infrastructure will be locked in this sector for many years, which makes it more difficult for new green competitors to come into the market. Path dependency can be reinforced by various lock-in mechanisms. And theory mentions three technology and infrastructure, institutional lock-ins, and then social and cultural practices. The first one, technology and infrastructure. Usually we talk about networks. And one familiar example for you here could be the electric car. Because many of you, I guess, wanted to buy an electric car when it came to the market. But it was a bit tricky to actually change your petrol car with an electric car from the outset. And the reason why was, of course, the recharging infrastructure. So these kind of networks have to be broken down, and it's possible. Then we have the institutional lock-ins. Norway is an oil and gas producing country. And for many years, we have established networks with close cooperation and relations between, for example, the government, large and powerful oil and gas companies, oil and gas lobby groups, and then labor unions. These strong networks makes it more difficult for the green competitors to come into the market. And then the last one was the social practice. Basically, that says something about the society, how we live. What do we do every day? How do we, how do we go to work? What kind of transport are we using? What kind of food are we eating? If you take it down from the theoretical point of view and go down to the more personal, have you thought about it? If you're going to do this green journey, what could you do? If I ask you, what kind of difficulties do you see if you're going to, from being a meat eater to become a vegan? Well, first you might think about where should I buy the food? Maybe you can't go to your local store because they might not have all the ingredients you need. And then it could be that you have to learn how to cook vegan food. And then you might have to give up your favorite meat dish. But it's all possible, isn't it? Then it's another example I will talk to you about, and that is changing jobs. Many of us have to change our jobs when we go through this green transmission in the society. How difficult is it really to do a major change to the work we're doing? To give you one example, when I used to work as an oil analyst and somebody asked me, if you're not going to work as an oil analyst in the bank you're doing, what are you going to do? And I thought, well, if I'm not going to work as an oil analyst here, I can go to the other bank and work as an oil analyst there. Not really a radical change. 
then I could push it a bit more. If I'm not going to work as an oil analyst in the financial sector, maybe I can go to an oil company. Still not really a radical change. I think that a more radical change was the one I was doing when I left uh, working as an oil analyst and started to work with sustainable finance because there were some barriers I had to go through. The first one was, of course, that I had to learn what sustainable finance was. So I had to sit down and read and study. Then there were some networks. I had to rebuild my client networks because obviously I would not talk that much to the old oil and gas clients any longer. But then the most surprising was maybe the internal network because when I changed my job, well, at least I expected or hoped for that some of my colleagues would pat me on the shoulder and say, congratulations, you got a new job. But it wasn't really so. Something was very, some of them were very skeptical. And the reason why I think is because I think somebody, some of them felt very threatened about my change because they had clients in the oil and gas business. And if I changed, from brown to green, they might feel threatened that they had to do the same thing some years from now. What we do the next decade is critical. To move away from dependency of high, a high emission path and to develop a new green path dependency, basically a new history, we need a system change that involves the whole society. So, what will it take you to recognize the need to move to a new green path? My personal step-by-step -step process started with awareness. I got aware of the climate challenge and the climate problem. Then it was information. I wanted to learn more about it. So I started to search, collect information by reading, by talking to people that knew about it, by reading research, watching films. Then it was the analysis. I started with the pros and the cons. Should I change? Should I stay? And then it was the decision time. I had to take a decision. Did I want to try to make my own green path? And then came action. And what I did was that I changed my job from working as an oil analyst to start with sustainable finance. And do I regret that? Not a second in my life. Yes, there were some barriers I had to break down from the outset. But then another new universe opened up at the other end. I do not, unfortunately, have the answers for all of you. But I hope this model or my step-by-step -step process to overcome my personal lock-ins could give you some inspiration to define your green path or at least be an idea worth spreading. Thank you.